Okay, welcome everybody to the Gold Room. We are going to start. This is Robert Secord, Java Serialization, The Serial Killer. Without further ado. Thanks. Ooh. <laughs> Applause. Um, so uh, that's, that's me in my fully evolved form. Uh, for those of you who watch, uh, I don't know, anime, I guess. Uh, I'm a technical <laughs> director at NCC Group. Um, I spend uh, my, my time sort of split between three activities. Uh, one of those activities is developing, delivering uh, secure coding training classes in Java, C, C++, C Sharp. Uh, the material um, presenting today is sort of cut down from a full day I uh, developed on serialization, um, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of an interesting idea because now I'm trying to figure out who wants to listen to me talk about serialization for a full day, but, it, but a few people have. Um, I also do secure coding research, which at NCC Group mainly publishing uh, white papers. There's actually is a white paper on Java serialization on our uh, on the NCC Group website. If you'd like to have a look at that, and uh, the third thing I do is uh, code security reviews. So try to keep uh, keep my hands in it, and uh, you know uh, make sure I sort of maintain uh, the skill set, not just uh, you know teach. So. Uh, how, how many of you here do Java serialization? Uh, okay, just David Svoboda and maybe three or four of you. Um, how many of you are Java developers? How many of you just like came in the wrong room by accident? <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll give a quick intro into Java serialization. I, I try to trim this down to fit the available time and um, I decided to focus on demos because I thought people like demos. So, um, uh, so I, I had to kind of eliminate some of the, the overview stuff. Uh, but Java serialization in general supports transformation of a graph of objects into a stream of bytes which can be stored or transmitted. So uh, you have objects which um, are serialized. The serialized data can then be stored in a file in a database or just maintained in memory. And then the, um, the objects can be reconstituted from the serialized data. Uh, so, of course, the serialized form has to identify and verify the class information. There's no uh, source code that gets transmitted. It's just information about the uh, actual object. So to reconstitute these objects, uh, the source code has to be available to the JVM that's, um, you know, deserializing the objects. And so the source code will be loaded uh, just as Java normally loads uh, classes, you know, looking through the class path and so forth. So uh, let's say we have a, a simple class, a bicycle class, and we want to serialize it. Uh, it's, it's exceedingly simple. Um, so uh, we create an output stream, which in this case is a file output stream, to receive the bytes. Uh, so basically we're creating a, a file called temp. Uh, then we create an object output stream to decorate the file uh, output stream object. And then we call the write method on object output stream. We create a new instance of this object and uh, call write object on it. That serializes the object. And then we just uh, flush the stream. To then deserialize that, we, we just do the opposite process. We create an input stream, which is a file input stream to lead, uh, read in the temp file. Uh, and then we uh, create a new object input stream object. And then we uh, call uh, the read object method on object input stream to uh, deserialize uh, the object. So read object just returns a generic object because it can be used to deserialize any type of object. So typically um, what the developer does here is they cast uh, the return value from read object to the anticipated type of the object that's being deserialized. So in this particular case, the developer is anticipating a bicycle object. Um, so there are a series of callbacks that can be used to, to customize how objects are serialized. Um, uh, so I, uh, a lot of times people think that if these callbacks are used, that indicates that there's a problem with the code. But uh, it, it, it turns out that um, sort of uh, creating these custom methods is, is, is really sort of a necessary part of uh, implementing serialization securely. And uh, for more details on that, probably come to the six-hour class because that gets uh, gets in the weeds. Um, so there's a write replace method which replies, uh, re provides a replacement object to serialize. That's basically for use with proxy objects. Um, 
the, the write object method gives full control over writing the stream. So uh, if, when, if you implement write object, you can um, either accept sort of the default serialized form, or you can decide I want to only serialize these fields, or you could decide that you want to write information that has nothing at all to do with the object that you're serializing. Uh, you have complete control. Uh, during deserialization, of course, you, you need to implement a read object method that corresponds to your write object method. Uh, so you actually read in the data that uh, was written out. And the read resolve is called to replace a deserialized object with another one. Again, basically to, to take a proxy object and use that proxy object to create uh, the actual object that you're, you're trying to uh, serialize and deserialize. Uh, and then finally, there's a validated object method that's called uh, after, um, after the objects have been uh, created. Uh, and also after it's sort of too late to uh, ensure the security of the, uh, the transaction. So during serialization, the write replace method is executed first. Uh, and then uh, if it's present, the write object method will operate on the replacement object, not on the original object. During deserialization, read object is called uh, potentially to work on a proxy object. If it is a proxy object, then there'll be a read resolve method uh, invoked. Uh, and then finally, uh, the call to validate the object. Uh, so the validation method is executed on the replacement object, not on the proxy object. That's silently discarded. So if you look at uh, a UML sequence diagram here, you see we have the application code, and it's it's implementing those four lines of code I showed earlier uh, to uh, you know just read the bytes from the file or uh, any stream, uh, initialize the object input stream, uh, then uh, read the object from the stream with the read object uh, method call. Uh, that transfers control to the object input stream, uh, which uh, resolves the classes of the stream using resolve class. So that's just the normal process of looking up the, uh, the definition of the class uh, corresponding to the object that's being deserialized. And, you know, that could already be loaded into memory or it could be loaded by, you know, looking at the bootstrap loader and, um, looking at the class path and just uh, the normal process by which classes are loaded. Uh, so then we go to deserialize the objects. And, um, you know, there can be any number of objects in the serialization stream. Even, even serializing a single object, typically that object references other objects. So in order to serialize a single object, that typically serializes a, an entire graph of objects. Uh, and also you could have multiple objects in a single uh, stream. So for each object uh, discovered in the stream, uh, object input stream is going to call the uh, read object, read resolve, and validate object methods if, they're, uh, if they've been implemented. If not, they'll uh, call basically uh, default versions of, uh, default version of read object. So it finally uh, returns control to the application code, which again uh, casts the deserialized object to the expected type. In the previous example, that was a bicycle, uh, and then goes ahead and uses the deserialized object. And eventually, um, these objects are finalized, which people forget about, and a lot of uh, uh, Java serialization researchers um, don't talk about. But that, that finalized call might actually be the most dangerous thing up on this slide. Um, so the security issues, uh, and here's, my, here's a kind of classic understatement. Uh, naive use of object serialization may allow a malicious party with access to the serialization byte stream to read private data. Uh, or create objects with invalid or dangerous state. And, and the security uh, issue in a, in a nutshell is that this, uh, this guy down here who accidentally cut his hand off or slicing a sandwich, he could probably implement serialization, right? It's just those three or four lines of code I showed you earlier. Uh, but to get it right, you have to be extremely knowledgeable. And so this sort of gap here is, is basically the security problem. <laughs> you know, this ability to people to deploy systems that use serialization without kind of understanding uh, how these things can be uh, uh, attacked. So default serialization of object writes all the fields to serialization stream. That includes private fields, packaged private fields, protected public. Um, and so there's, there's, no, there's really no attempt at all uh, at protecting <laughs> the serialized data, right? So the, the first mistake you can make is just to uh, serialize some sensitive information and uh, make that available to someone who shouldn't have access to it because there's no protection at all. You can look at the, the files and basically you'll see the ASCII right in the file. And 
if that's inadequate, there's a, there's a specification which fully defines all the fields, and there's some tools which will, you know, uh, convert them into human readable form for you. So um, there's, there are no protections. And, and you can see here that the private data is also written out, right? So any private field you have is going to be exposed. Um, malicious code can even um, uh, basically uh, access private fields within a serialized object by just serializing the object and then, uh, you know, kind of manually going through the resulting byte stream to extract the private information. So that's a, yet another way a sensitive information can get leaked out. Um, all these are covered by a single CWE, uh, deserialization of untrusted data. The consequences of, of these vulnerabilities um, vary widely. Uh, we talked already about leaking uh, private fields. Uh, it's, it's able, your attackers can also modify the objects. So, um, you know, if you get a, uh, a cookie, which is a serialized data that's got your bank account name on it, and you decide that there's not enough money in your bank account, you'd rather have uh, Bill Gates' bank account, you could just modify the object and send that modified object to the uh, service. Uh, these can be very simply exploited for denial of service attacks and also remote code execution. So, so these, these problems have been around for a long time, but in the last couple years, these sort of blew up quite a lot when people, uh, uh, you know, were able to figure out that serialization is used in RMI and, uh, and you know, RMI and serialization is used in uh, WebSphere and Cisco products and uh, JMS and, and, you know, 15 or 20 other uh, popular, um, you know, software infrastructures that people regularly deploy. Uh, so, so, so this, these vulnerabilities are sort of out there in spades and, uh, they're, they're, uh, not at all difficult to exploit. So here's a very, uh, a simple unrealistic, uh, remote, uh, command execution example. And when I say simple and unrealistic, I mean, you know, uh, I can guarantee we found this in code, right? But, uh, I have to say it's simple and unrealistic because, um, you know, it looks kind of dumb. Um, but so here we've got a, a gadget that's serializable, and it's got a private field here called command, uh, and it's got a, a read. So let me talk about this this command, right? So so the purpose of this, you know, the, what the developer was thinking here was probably, um, you know, I want to um, I want to write a class that's going to invoke commands in a safe way. So I'm going to have command field, which is a private field, uh, and this is this is going to be set, uh, you know, we're going to have restricted access to this by making it private, so we're only going to be able to set that through methods, a defined interface to safe, secure commands that can be executed. Uh, but what happens is we have a read object method which then um, calls um, runtime exec uh, on the command. And the problem, of course, here is that the attacker, an attacker who can access this serialized data, can very simply edit um, or, or, you know, modify uh, the serialized form of this to put any command here they want, right? And when this object gets deserialized, uh, this command is going to be executed. So this is a very simple version of this, but the, the principle is largely the same, right? So what happens is the, the attacker can identify, uh, can provide whatever objects really they want in the serialization stream. Uh, it doesn't have to be the one the uh, developer is expecting. Uh, and then they can basically invoke uh, code in these objects using attacker-supplied data. So it's a form of, uh, um, almost a form of uh, a kind of, you know, return-oriented programming with uh, invocation of gadgets. So here's a quick list of uh, some of the protocols that uh, use uh, serialization. So if you use any of these things, you could likely uh, be affected by uh, these class of vulnerabilities. Okay, so uh, the further problem with deserialization is, is code is susceptible to vulnerability uh, even when the code really appears to be correct, right? So the, the code I showed you before is more or less correct. That's how you deserialize, but uh, it, it is completely vulnerable to these exploits. Um, so again, an attacker could provide an instance of an unexpected class and send it to a service that will then deserialize that malicious object. And, and, and likely cast it to the expected type. So when the cast occurs, uh, you'll, get a, uh, you'll get a cast exception, right? But by the time that exception occurs, it's already too late because the entire exploit has already completed. 
Um, so, uh, so here's our again deserialization process. And during this, um, you know, the deserialization of each object in the stream, uh, it's going to invoke uh, these methods: uh, read object, read resolve, uh, and validate object. So basically, the attacker, um, you know, provides a list of objects, and for each object, it's going to call these methods uh, with the data they supply. And so what they can do is they can basically, you know, uh, specify uh, a program that's going to execute in your JVM. Uh, driven by this data, right? So they can run any existing code, uh, and there's enough code there that um, you know it's not too hard to piece together, uh, uh, in, you know, a program that's going to have some uh, malicious impact, such as calling runtime exec on a on a command. Okay, so let's do a demonstration. Um, this demonstration uses the Apache Commons collection. Uh, Invoker Transformer got a lot of bad press, so I didn't use that. I used a different gadget. Um, you know, a common solution to this problem is blacklisting gadgets. Uh, that solution is, um, I'm going to use the ill-informed, uh, because there is, not a, there is not a known set of uh, dangerous gadgets. This is sort of an unknown, unlimited set of dangerous gadgets out there. So uh, blacklisting is not an appropriate approach. Uh, I'll show you some code. Everyone excited about seeing code? Thank you. <laughs> um, so this is, I'm going to show you SCR05. Um, let me debug this a little bit instead of just running it. Uh, so we're going to uh, call basically this RCA, RCE payload method. I'll step into that. Uh, this is going to create a, a command uh, exploit that we're going to, uh, you know, th this is the payload. So our payload here is going to be the calc program. Uh, someone asked me once, you know, can, can you also call a command with parameters? And yes, you can. Uh, that was what this script was for. So going through this quickly, uh, we're going to create a constant transformer object. Uh, we're going to create an instantiate transformer object, uh, get some of the uh, parameters, create a chain transformer and a priority queue, add a couple things to the queue, uh, activate the attack. And now we're going to serialize this gadget chain uh, that I'm using for this exploit. Uh, I'll step into the serialization code real quick. Um, this is the equivalent to what I showed you on the slide earlier. We're just creating an object output stream and a try with resources block. And then we call the write object method. And here we're just converting it in memory to a, uh, a byte array. Uh, so that's the serialized attack. And now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take that serialized payload and we're going to deserialize it. So again, I'll step into that. Uh, so again, we have an object input stream now and a try with resources block. And this, this read object here, as soon as I execute the read object, that entire exploit is going to get triggered. So, uh, so this, this whole exploit will occur before read object returns, meaning that any cast you have here to, to detect an invalid type is uh, coming too late. So I'm just going to hit single step here, uh, and you'll see that there's a calculator, and you can use this to figure out how much everyone should pay for lunch, including a 15% tip and... Uh, all works just fine. Um, okay, so that's the end of that demo. Go back to the slides. So there's your remote command execution. I had some, I gave this class once, and someone right at this point raised their hand and said, uh, so what's the danger? And I, I just kind of, jaw kind of fell open and someone else in the audience had to explain to them how, how don't want attackers running code on your systems. <laughs> Seemed obvious to me. Um, okay, so here's another uh, demo, which is a, um, a DOS attack uh, developed by this guy Volter Kokertz. Uh, at least I think that's how his name's pronounced. I haven't had anyone try to correct me yet, so it seems like a close approximation at least. So, so he defined a hash set with cycles. Um, and it's, it's actually particularly devious because it doesn't exhaust memory, which will eventually will cause an out-of-memory exception. Uh, what this does is just recurses indefinitely, consuming CPU, uh, and, you know, runs forever. 
Um, so I'll show you this one real quick. Um, the, um, let me show you the code. So, so here's the DOS, uh, the DOS payload. Uh, we're just going to create a hash set and then we're going to loop and, and basically create new hash sets and assign them to other hash sets and sort of create this uh, cyclic structure. So that's, that's all there is to it. It's very simple. Uh, the demo is, this one's a little bit cerebral, cerebral, Cere you know what word I'm trying to say? Like in the mind? I, I get, yeah, sorry. Um, one of the things that goes when you get older is sort of your vo vocabulary. Um, I, I work from home from an uh, NCC group, you know, so one of the things I did early on was I, I put a sign on my front door um, that says put pants on, you know, so that, that doesn't happen again because... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, uh, so, so this example, I'm going to create a thread and in that thread I'm going to deserialize the DOS payload. Uh, then I'm going to wait 10 seconds. So in computing terms, 10 seconds is basically infinity because we don't want to wait until the sun burns out to see if this uh, returns. So I'm just going to run this. Uh, and basically, if you see exiting appear in the console, uh, it means that uh, this, this thread never completed because of the DOS attack. If you see DOS has been deserialized, uh, my, um, you know, my demo would have ended in an embarrassing fashion. <laughs> uh, but instead, you know, uh, this, this never completes. Uh, so that's a wonderful little attack just using a hash table, deserializing a hash table, which obviously is part of the uh, Java runtime environment. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, so I, I want to mention also Apache Commons uh, file upload, uh, which is another kind of dangerous gadget. So this has a class called disk file item. Uh, which handles file uploads, is serializable, has custom write object and read object methods. Uh, and uh, this also allows remote execution and file manipulation using the, the, the call to finalize. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing about the call to finalize is it runs as part of a separate thread. Uh, so this call to, uh, you know, it's called from the garbage collector, it's part of a separate thread. So this call is not in the same security context as the normal deserialization. Right? So it's outside of the security context, which makes it uh, even more uh, dangerous. Uh, sort of, you know, eliminates any mitigation you might have tr attempted uh, by you know, uh, removing privileges. Um, so uh, in this, uh, really there's just, uh, in the finalized method, there's some code which goes and deletes a file, right? And so the risk here is that the name of the file is supplied by the attacker. Right. So the attacker can, uh, you know, modify the serialized data, specify whatever file they want to, uh, you know, blow away on your system. And when this object gets finalized, that file is, uh, is file is removed. Okay. So risk factors and all this. Um, so, so the biggest risk factor is, you know, are you deserializing untrusted data? You know, and a lot of people do this, right? People will serialize a cookie. Uh, on their client system and then deserialize it. Of course, that's untrusted because it, it got to the, uh, to the end user. Um, you know, if, you, um, if you're just doing serialization with, within your trusted computing boundary, within your trusted computer base, uh, it might not be so bad. Um, so does it take place before authentication? It sort of makes it worse. Um, it's nice to know at least the email of the person who's attacking you, not that it's real. Um, and um, is there any attempt to limit what types can be deserialized, which is uh, kind of an effective mitigation, uh, you know, basically whitelisting mitigation. And also, there's always this question, does the deserialization host have gadgets that can be uh, utilized in attack? Any, anyone want to hazard a guess at that question? Do you think the uh, host has gadgets that can be used in the attack? There's a couple of people nodding. So the answer is yes, yes it does. I don't even think that, well, I haven't installed uh, Apache Common, so uh, I'm not at risk, <laughs> you know. Uh, there, there are a number of, uh, you know, dangerous gadgets that have been identified, but I, I think it's very clear that there are many more which have not been identified. Um, so I wanted to touch briefly on a mitigation. So, so, so the, the primary mitigation, again, is, you know, 
just don't do this. <laughs> you know, don't deserialize um, untrusted data. The, the problem here, I, I mean, I, I would describe this as the most difficult problem in software security. Because basically, the problem you're trying to solve by deserializing untrusted data is how do I execute attacker supplied code securely in my environment, right? That's basically what you're doing. So it's a really, really, really tough problem to solve. Um, so uh, if you decide to try to solve this problem, <laughs> um, you know, uh, look ahead deserialization uh, uh, can be used for whitelisting or blacklisting. Now I've already put, mo most people use it for blacklisting and I've also pointed out that blacklisting is 100% ineffective. Right? So if, if, if your web logic or whatever, you know, is blacklisted invoker transformer, uh, you are still completely vulnerable to attacks, just not the most popular one. Um, so there are a bunch of existing off-the-shelf uh, off solutions. There's even one that kind of has the name of my, 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 <laughs> my talk. Um, but my favorite has become um, the JDK, the JP290, uh, which was implemented by Oracle and uh, uh, and shipped starting with Java 9, and also portions of it were backported to Java 6, 7, and 8. So, um, so the way this Java serialization filtering works uh, is uh, basically uh, allows uh, uh, filtering of the classes before um, they, they, they're deserialized, before uh, the read object method starts to, to invoke these various callback methods. Uh, so we can, uh, we can narrow the set of deserializable classes to a context uh, appropriate set of classes. You can also filter for uh, graph size and complexity to try to eliminate uh, the denial of service attacks. Um, I'll show you in a minute that uh, that doesn't work. <laughs> so um, it's very, uh, well basically that, that Walter, Walter Kokert's attack, DOS attack I showed you is exceptionally tiny and there are no limits small enough to be set that would prevent that particular DOS attack. So the, um, you know, the, the limits that a lot of these tools implement is not particularly effective at preventing DOS attacks. Um, so, so they're um, starting in Java 9, um, and now I guess Java 9 is already obsolete. Um, this is kind of a fast moving world, so Java 10. Um, you have process-wide filters, custom filters, and built-in filters. Uh, the core mechanism upon which all these things is built uh, is a filter interface, uh, which is set on the object input stream. The process-wide filters, they're kind of the big hammer uh, solution. Um, those were backported to JDK 8, 7, and 6 as of these versions. So if you're using, uh, you know, an older version of Java, and many people are still using uh, JDK 8 because it's sort of the long-term supported version uh, right now of, uh, of Java, uh, you can at least use this process-wide filter. So the process-wide filter is configured via system property or configuration file. Uh, so the system property is JDK serial filter and security property is the same but in the uh, cost security Java properties. Um, and the, um, and it's basically kind of a string, well I'll show you what it looks like. Um, so custom filters can be written by implementing the object input filter interface and overriding the check input method. You need to be using uh, Java 9 or later to, to take advantage of this. Uh, there's two methods added to object input stream. There's a set object input filter and a get object input filter. Um, and you can also set uh, filters using config set serial filter which affect uh, every object input stream that doesn't otherwise have a filter. Uh, if there's no filter, then uh, a global filter is used if it's defined. So let me do a demo of this and might sort of cut this down a little bit in the interest of time. I think I have 20 minutes left, which is, maybe I could show more of this. Yeah, I've only got two slides left, so I'll take, actually I'll take my time. It's going pretty fast. <laughs> I maybe eliminate more slides than I need it to. Um, okay, so let me demo this. Um, and you know, now that I'm less afraid of the time, I'll say, ask questions. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, this is down here. Uh, I have it in a different, 
uh, project because I needed to use uh, Java 9 or now I'm up to uh, Java 10. And I guess what I'll show first is I'll show the vulnerable code. So I'm going to take out the mitigation here and start to debug this. Um, so one of the things I did here, um, which I, I mostly think was a good idea, was I uh, I swapped out okay I swapped out the uh, default uh, Java compiler and I used um, the Google compiler which is called let me cheat and look oh error prone uh, and error prone is kind of cool I mean it just diagnoses so, so, so usually uh, here David could back me up on this you know, you, you run into the Sun Java guys once in a while and you say, could you please flag? And they're like, no. Like, well, how about, no. <laughs> and they're like, well, it's too many false positives. We're not going to flag that. And so what, what error prone did was, you know, every one of those requests to flag something, they implement it. <laughs> so, so error prone actually flags all these sort of dangerous uh, pieces of code. And, you know, if you don't like false positives, I guess don't use error prone. Go back to using just the normal uh, Oracle compiler. Um, okay, so in this example, we're going to serialize a bicycle. Um, I'm sure this is working. Okay, so we're going to serialize a bicycle and we're going to serialize a file object. The idea here is that the bicycle is what we want to serialize, deserialize, and the file is what we do not. It's, it's the misuse case. So we're going to deserialize the bicycle. Uh, and that, uh, there's the call to read object. And so that works just wonderfully. And now we're going to deserialize our file. And uh, there's the call to read object. And that also works wonderfully. And what I've done here is um, instead of sort of casting this to expected type, I just assigned it to an object. That eliminates the actual cast exception that you should receive. Uh, this seems like a stupid thing to do, but again, uh, it's not uncommon for us to find this in source code that we evaluate. Um, okay, so let me modify this code and we'll show uh, the mitigations. So what we're going to do here is we're going to uh, we're going to add a custom filter, this bike filter, to the um, object input stream. And let's go ahead and debug that. Um, the bicycle filter. Well, I guess you'll see it. When start to look at it. Okay, so we're going to serialize the bicycle. Uh, we're going to serialize the file. And now we're going to deserialize the bicycle. There's the read object method. Uh, and now the read object me method invokes the custom filter that we've installed. So here's the custom filter. It makes a call to check input. Uh, and you can see here in the output that I just printed out some of the data that's passed here, right? So you can see the number of references, the depth, uh, you know, the depth of the object graph, uh, the number of bytes, and the actual name of the class being deserialized, which is bicycle. So we check uh, the limits, and uh, none of the limits are exceeded, so we're good there. Then we get the name of the class. Uh, we find out it's a bicycle, and um, this is sort of interesting. <laughs> you ever change your code just before the night before you give a demo and then forgot to change it back? So that's what I did. So, so what this was supposed to say here was uh, accept it, reject it, and undecided. But now it says undecided because I was wondering what would happen if it just returned undecided. Now the interesting thing here, let me show you. So we're going to uh, return undecided. Um, if you return undecided, um, it will actually deserialize the object. So that will actually succeed. Uh, but my next one is not going to work because it's supposed to be rejected. Um, so um, I guess let's fix it. So, oh, bicycle filter. Um, so this should be accepted.
Am I spelling accept it wrong? And here I'm going to do reject it. That shows up. Let me go back here. Okay, you know what? We'll just do undecided for now. Because <laughs> it does work. <laughs> uh, it turns out uh, I, I was off looking at the you know, um, Oracle source code. And they never do a test on anything besides reject it, uh, which means that in their code that handles this, uh, accept it and undecided are handled exactly the same. Uh, normally, this should be uh, accept it and this should be undecided here. But uh, let's go ahead and try this again. Go into um, I'm going to stop the code from running, and then we'll. Oh, sorry. We'll go ahead and debug this again. Yeah, so the problem with error prone is it compiles a little slower, which makes it not perfect for demos. But Okay, so we're going to create the bicycle object. We're going to create the file object. We're going to deserialize the bicycle object. Uh, now we're, uh, well, we're still returning undecided. It still works. And now we're going to deserialize the file object. So we call read object. We're into the filter method. And you can see here now we're dealing with deserializing a file object. Again, the, all, the, all the limits are quite small, so that's not going to trigger the rejection. Um, but the class now is, is a file. It's not a bicycle. So based on that, uh, this will be rejected. And uh, that will cause... Um, that will cause an exception to be thrown. So you'll see here that we end up with a uh, invalid class exception. So the deserialization is prevented. Um, so let me just, well, I guess I'll, I still have 12 minutes. So I'll show the whole demo that I normally show. Uh, so here I'm going to disable the custom filter and I'm going to show the process wide filter. So the advantage of this one is that, um, you know, it sets for everything in your JVM. And uh, also it's available in Java 6, 7, and 8. So this is something you could use today if you're using Java 8. Uh, so let me start to compile this. There's a distinct lack of interest in process wide filters. I thought these were sort of more interesting than that. Um, so here's the filter basically that's being set. Uh, and it, it takes a little practice to get this right. So the, f the first time I did this, I said, you know, don't serialize anything and then serialize bicycle. And it turned out that basically said don't serialize anything <laughs> because that first filter would catch everything. So you have to put sort of the more specialized filters here. So what I'm saying now is do serialize bicycle but don't seri uh, deserialize anything else. And then I set some limits uh, for no good reason because this this does not work. <laughs> the limits have not been successful. Uh, so if I go ahead and debug this, um, uh, let me just run it. Okay. Uh, you'll see that uh, the filter uh, snags. Uh, did it snag? No, it didn't snag yet. Okay. So this filter that we set, this process-wide filter, uh, snags that, uh, you know, based on this filter, it says, hey, bicycle's allowed, but nothing else is allowed. So it rejects the, uh, the file class. Okay, so one last example, and then we're done with this, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, so for the last example, I'm going to go back to the uh, the custom. All right, everybody, we're trying to get lunch set up for you all, so please make sure to keep room in the hallways for the lunch, people to get the food back for you, and also, it's not quite the time to get in line for lunch yet, so just hold off, there's plenty of food for everybody, and it's going to be starting at noon, so. So I want to paraphrase. And the booze will be open at noon, too, so form two lines. 
One for the booze and one for the food. Thank you. I want to paraf uh, paraphrase Jar Jar Binks here and say, how wooed. <laughs> That's the first time I did a Jar Jar Binks impersonation. It works okay, I guess. Okay, so I just uh, made that last change and then I ran this. And uh, what I can show you here is that this DOS attack at the end, this uh, Vulture co co attack, it winds up getting defeated. Now, the, the interesting thing about this is it's not defeated because of the limits, right? So you see here the Vulture co attack has, has one reference. It's, it's less bytes than the bicycle attack. It's 36 bytes. Uh, and and there's, there's really nothing here that you can detect with a limit. The only reason it gets caught is because hash set wasn't in my whitelist. And, and so it turns out that you really don't want to serialize hash sets anyway, so it's a good, it's a good object to, uh, to leave out of your, your whitelist of objects. Uh, okay, so going back to the slides. Um, the, uh, so the primary mitigation for this stuff, again, is do not serialize untrusted data. Uh, it's really a tough thing to get right. Um, you know, if you need to do that, um, you can look at this look ahead object input streams to use whitelisting to deserialize only, uh, only those necessary classes. And then basically, you know, uh, you should come to my full day course and then I'll teach you how to write those whitelisted classes so they're secure, right? Because it's also very easy to make an error in implementing those classes. Um, so you can apply a custom filter with a whitelist for each uh, use of deserialization. That lets you be more precise about, um, you know, which objects can be deserialized in which context. Uh, and then I didn't talk about this at all, but it makes sense to have a security manager with a security policy so you can sort of limit the, the potential damage that might be done uh, if you're deserializing untrusted uh, objects. So that's, uh, I, that's it for my talk. Um, this is me. Um, this is my email address. Uh, I answer email 724. I know it sounds weird, but I, I will wake up at 2.45 a.m. on a Saturday morning and have, have uh, this instinct that someone just sent me an email, and you'll get a response within five minutes. So, um, And, um, you know, there's a, I have a, a, a live lessons out with Pearson, which is a video series on Java serialization. Feel free to enjoy that. It's open, also available on uh, Safari Books Online or uh, contact us and we can come to your organization and spend a whole day training your developers up on how to do uh, job serialization securely. Okay, that's it for me. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's just any any field in in the serialized object is open to um, tampering, right? Because the format's fully defined, so you know an attacker can just get it, get it and you know uh, edit the uh, the contents of the object and replace one file name with another. Um, typically, the way most attackers do this is they just they just write deserialization code um, and sort of create their own objects. Uh, with with their you know their specific values in order to create the sort of um, specially crafted malicious serialization stream, uh, but that tampering is really straightforward. I have normal you know in my normal training I, I show an example of popping open a file the serialization file and editing it and then saving it and the data is changed. Yeah, if you can get to the, you know, if you can get to the proxy object, right? So the proxy object is typically designed to be the perfect serialized form of the object, right? So it, it, its only purpose is to store the information and retrieve it, whereas the actual object, you know, is mostly designed to be efficient at runtime, right, or whatever functionality. But, um, but the proxy will make a copy of really the arguments um, to the uh, constructor for the actual object. 
and pass that data you know, to the object's constructor during the read resolve method. So, um, so that data is going to be serialized and it's susceptible to tampering just like really any other data. Those are good questions. I, I, you know, I was hoping uh, yeah, David next is smart. Um, he used to work for me at CERT. He knows all about serialization, but it's nice to know that there's like two people who understood. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't think there's any way to fix it. And furthermore, it's hash tables are, are not really designed for serialization because, um, because even, even without the attacker in the picture, because when you when you de if you deserialize it in a different JVM, uh, the keys aren't guaranteed to work anymore. Uh, so uh, so there's kind of multiple reasons not to uh, serialize and deserialize those sort of collections. What you could try is to use a proxy. You know, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know all the details of every, uh, but I guess in general, I'm, I'm at the highly suspicious point <laughs> where I wouldn't use any of these unless I could sort of prove to myself that it couldn't be used in a um, and, you know, a lot of experts in this area basically just kind of say that uh, DOS attacks are inevitable. You know, it's almost impossible to prevent them with the serialization of untrusted streams. Any other questions? Okay. I think there's lunch somewhere. So, thank you.